Hi everybody, and welcome back to the next installment of the Theory Teacher Teacher. We're not going to call this Chapter 2. This is going to be the first of a series of book reviews that we're doing about music theory textbooks and other sources. And I'm going to start with an unusual one today, but it's a book that's very near and dear to my heart by a composer who's very near and dear to my heart, and that's Vincent Persichetti and his book, which was kind of a landmark when he published it. It is 20th Century Harmony. Vincent Persichetti was born in 1915 in Philadelphia, and he remained a citizen of that city for his entire life. Uh, I am a proud Philadelphian, was not born there, but have been there since I went to college. Persichetti is a graduate of South Philadelphia High School, which is still in existence. He is a product of the Philadelphia Public School System, which I used to be a teacher in. Um, he then graduated from the Combs College of Music, which is sadly now out of business, although it was a long-established uh, institution, and uh, it produced some pretty remarkable figures. Uh, went out of business, I believe, in 1990. Um, after he graduated from Combs College of Music, as I said, he taught there, but he also maintained student status at the Philadelphia Conservatory of Music as a piano student with Olga Samarov. She's quite a character. Look her up sometime. Uh, by the way, he met his wife in Olga Samarov's studio. But he also was a student of Fritz Rainer's at Curtis Institute of Music, which is, of course, still going. Uh, Fritz Rainer was a bit of a tyrant. In fact, he was known as the Chicago Tormentor, uh, but Persichetti only said he had nice and fond memories of Mr. Rainer. That's not true of a lot of people, but... Anyway! He was a triple threat. He was a conductor, he was a pianist, and a really fabulous composer. And I would add to that, he was actually a quadruple threat, he was very, very highly regarded as a teacher. So, you can kind of see why I kind of have been drawn to him. In 1947, he joined the faculty of the Juilliard School of Music in New York City, where he taught both composition and he taught in the theory department. It was called something else back then, but essentially theory and musicianship. Uh, he held that position almost until the very end of his life. As if that wasn't enough, on Mondays every week, this is absolutely true, his Monday job was he was the editorial director for Elk and Vogel Publications, which is now part of Theodore Presser. So he was also in the publishing industry. As if all that wasn't enough, of course he had time to write, and he was a prolific composer. He wrote over 120 published works. He wrote a lot for what has now become the concert band or the wind ensemble. He has some really great pieces. Parade is is wonderful. I've done it. Um, Celebrations is a really great piece for both. Uh, it's a combined piece for wind ensemble and chorus. Uh, Symphony Six is one of the hallmarks of the band literature. There's a parable for band, etc. He was really devoted to the band medium when, at a time when a lot of other composers were not yet sure that this was going to be a serious thing. The opening and closing music to this video is from Persichetti's Concerto for Piano, Four Hands which I did on my senior recital with a really wonderful pianist named Max Christian, whom I've lost touch with. Max, if you're watching, please reach out. Love to hear from you. By the way, I'm coming to you today from my office at my employer, the Lawrenceville School. We'll talk more about where I work and how I work here uh, in another video, but um, here I am. If you'd like to learn more about Vincent Persichetti, a wonderful biography of his came out last year called Vincent Persichetti, Grazioso, Grit, and Gold by Andrea Olmsted. Um, fun fact, by the way, this is actually a self-portrait. He was also a really good visual artist, mostly sculpture. Um, but I'm still learning a great amount of stuff about him. It's, uh, as you can see, it's extensive. But it's good. In 1961, Persichetti published this book called 20th Century Harmony. As you can see, this is my copy. It's very well loved and well used. Um, it is a really neat little book. Um, and the title is a little misleading, 20th Century Harmony. Um, in fact, there's much more than harmony in it. There's a fair amount of melody, rhythm, and other concepts in here. Really what it is is uh, a survey of 20th century techniques for composition uh, and analysis, of course. But it first is, it is first and foremost, I swear I can talk, it is first and foremost really a composition textbook. If we look at some of the... We have... Uh, I can talk. If we look at some of the contexts here, we have chords by fourths, added note chords, chords by seconds, polychords, compound mirror harmony, harmonic direction, key centers, harmonic synthesis. These are pretty heavy stuff. And actually, the first few chapters I find particularly um, 
important. One is intervals, one is scale materials, and one is chords by thirds. In particular, the second chapter is really good because the first thing he presents is not the major and minor scales. He presents the diatonic modes as source. And it's pretty neat. In fact, I would say it's the best presentation of the diatonic modes that I have seen in any textbook. He doesn't cheat and just you know give the white key modes the way a lot of textbooks do, especially as an afterthought. No, he presents them very much as they're all equal, and in fact they can all be in any key center. A great thing to reinforce. And if you look here on this first page of scale materials, he'll give you the here we are, Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, of course, unfortunately there's a page turn there. But you can see he also has some transposed to C for comparison, and you can go from there. He talks about primary and secondary triads within modal writing, tendency tones, characteristic flavor, how to mix and use them. It's pretty good. As far as modal modality goes, this is about the best you're going to get. Another thing for the teacher in you, there are wonderful, he calls them exercises, at the um, end of each chapter, which can very easily be made into assignments, but they're a little unusual. Here's one. Construct a declamatory phrase for three horns using chords built by equidistant intervals, or equidistant. Either or. Write a passage for string quartet using only chords of mixed intervals. Write a percussive passage for string orchestra using excessive doubling and coupling. So, you know, the students get to do something really different. Uh, I used to use these when I taught at Ridley for a, for a while as with my more advanced students, and they were always really... Um, they felt unleashed when they did these. These are great little piece, uh, great little primers for pieces that you can write in the classroom and then talk about. So here we are in my classroom at the piano, and I want to show you a couple of things in the Persicades modal section of the book because I think these are unique and important. Um, the first is he does not merely present the modes as cyclical permutations of the white keys of the piano, right? Major. Etc. Etc. Now, many textbooks do that, and I know a lot of teachers present them that way to get students started with the modes, and that's great. And there's plenty of D Dorian out in the world, and, and F Lydian, and G Mixolydian, etc. But one of the great things about this book is it takes, you know, it helps you transpose everything to a C center, and it makes emphasis that you can move things to different uh, centers. So you can help your students divorce the idea that all Dorian has to be in D, all Lydian has to be in F, etc., um, which is a good thing. The other thing that he does is he arranges them on a spectrum from dark to light, and I, I love playing this passage for students and, and having them realize what that exactly means. So he arranges the modes in all in C. Starts with Locrian, then Phrygian, then Aeolian, then, Dior, then Dorian, excuse me, then Mixolydian, then Aeolian, then Lydian, and as I said, on a, on a spectrum from dark to light. So usually when I perform it, I'll play tonic notes so that they can get that in their head, and then usually with pedal. fast. Dark to light. Persicetti encourages free use of the modes um, within the context of a composition. And in fact, he has a wonderful little passage here that I always play for the students, which is a mixture of all of the modes centered on A moving from dark to light, from Locrian all the way through Lydian. And it says it's, it, he indicates that it's for clarinet, obviously we don't have a clarinet here, and I'll do it in the printed uh, pitch. By the way, a lot of these examples show up in one of his great band works called Masquerade, and uh, it's really neat to have a band composition 
but is both very musical and neat and is based off of a theory textbook. That's unusual. Um, band in theory. Gee, I wonder why I like this. Anyway, so example 210 is marked at 66 and starts with, as I said, Locrian and moves all the way through all the modes to Lydian. But there it is, a passage moving from dark to light through all the modes. It's pretty neat. Another thing I really like about this is the fact that he approaches old materials in a new way. In fact, we only need to go chords by thirds, and there we have triads. All of us have beaten triads to death, but he talks about them in a slightly different way here. He talks about their relationship within each other, how to move um, through different cycle of fifths patterns, cycle of second patterns, etc. So even a concept as stale as triads in a theory textbook is given new treatment here, and it's really great. Of course, every book is not perfect, and this is no different. Um, one of the greatest drawbacks is uh, its publication date. It was published in 1961, so some of the post-60 trends, post-1960 trends in music, they're not going to be in here. Uh, there isn't anything on phase music, there isn't anything on minimalism, etc., and, and some of the other stuff. It just wasn't a thing yet. The other great drawback, and this this one he caught a lot of heat for when it was published, serialism is really only given a teeny little treatment here towards the back, and in fact it is not strict serialism. This is not the serialism of Arnold Schoenberg, although it has roots in there. Um, he talks about, you have to look really hard to find the word tone row. In fact, he talks about melodic sets and things like that, and he talks Here's the one, my deluxe set with identical notes. Ooh, big no-no for Mr. Schoenberg. But he talks much more about, and he admits right off the back, it's free serialism. So um, it's serialism with a flavor of Persichetti. Or Persichetti with a flavor of serialism. Your choice. The other uh, great drawback about this is it assumes a very high level of basic musicianship. This is not your book for your Foundations of Music class. It might very well be your book for an advanced unit, a uh, series of students. If you have a student who is interested in doing a composition independent study, this is a great place to point them. But um, no, it doesn't even go through a discussion as a lot of theory books start with, here's the clef, here's the staff, da 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 da. No, that's all assumed. And in fact, um, you have to start, well, right at the very beginning here. The first thing is intervals, and <laughs> you know, there's the first musical example. It assumes a pretty high level of musicianship. Not a bad thing. Persichetti was a consummate musician. That's probably why. But not a great fit for everybody. Fun fact that it came to light about this book. Um, recently, or at least me anyway, when it came through reading his biography, um, his wife, Dorothea, whom I originally mentioned he met in uh, his piano studio, or pardon me, Olga Samarov's studio. They were both excellent pianists. Um, she wrote a lot of the prose for this. He wrote all the musical examples. She wrote a lot of the words. Apparently she was a better wordsmith than he was. Uh, speaking of the musical examples, all of them are his. Um, that can be seen as a drawback. And, of course, when it was published, he took a little bit of heat for that as well. However, at the back of each section is a unit on source material. And, in fact, almost none of those examples are his. Here, for example, is the one on polychords. And you can see here's Bartok's and on a number two which um, publisher to look at and what page, and you can find these concepts. So those are, they're almost treated as afterthoughts in the book, but they're really actually quite important. You can go into the canon of literature and show your students. So that's uh, Vincent Persichetti's 20th Century Harmony. I'd like to close actually with the first opening in it, which has become somewhat infamous, but really famous, and you can probably see why. This is how it opens. Any tone can succeed any other tone. Any tone can sound simultaneously with any other tone or tones, and any group of tones can be followed by any other group of tones, just as any degree of tension or nuance can occur in any medium, under any kind of stress or duration. 
Successful projection will depend upon the contextual and formal conditions that prevail and upon the skill and the soul of the composer. Wise words to all of us. So, as always, keep being musical, and I will see you soon. Thank you.